Good afternoon, it's Friday, December 4. I'm Giovanni Dennis with the Midday News. A special welcome if you're watching online at onespotmedia.com. The opposition leader appointment of Dr. of Peter Bunting as a senator has hit a snag today after it was discovered that Norman Horn's appointment to the upper house is still in force. Now, Mr. Horn had been named the eighth opposition senator by former leader Dr. Peter Phillips in September. Now, following Dr. Phillips' recommendation, the Governor General Sir Patrick Allen issued the instrument of office for the eight PNP senators. Although Norman Horn had indicated that he would not be taking up the appointment, he had not formally signed as a senator, resigned rather, as a senator. This meant Peter Bunting, who knew this meant Peter Bunting, who new opposition leader, who the new opposition leader recommended to be appointed to the Senate, could not be appointed. Now, RJR News has learned that Norman Horn is seeking to leverage his resignation as senator to obtain money he claims the party owes him. On October 7, Norman Horn wrote then General Secretary Julian Robinson referencing a $19.38 million liability. Mr. Horn indicated to Mr. Robinson that he would deduct a series of payments for party dues, membership fees, pledges he made in the past, group dues, and a personal contribution to the party of $7.6 million, leaving a balance of $10 million. Mr. Horn asked Mr. Robinson to confirm that all he wrote in the October 7 email and action taken. However, it appears that some is still outstanding and Mr. Horn's decision to resign hinges on the payment of that money. The Ministry of Health says facilities have been identified to store COVID-19 vaccines that will be selected for Jamaicans. However, when the first batch of vaccines are available in the island, it will be administered to only 15% of the population. Details in this report. More than eight million U.S. dollars. That's how much it is expected to cost the government for the first phase of the rollout of the COVID-19 vaccine in Jamaica. At Thursday's sitting of the Public Administration and Appropriations Committee (PAAC), Permanent Secretary in the Ministry of Health Dunstan Brand disclosed that payment of just over one million U.S. dollars has already been made. The balance, he explained will be paid from the next budget. The subsidized cost for the 20% is around um, 8.2 8 million US dollars. Um, and we have had the, the initial deposit of about 1.1 million dollars um, through CARFA, which is the Caribbean Public Health Agency. Um, and so the balance, we are programming for fiscal year 2021, 22. 22. Right. Yeah. And, and, and I'm hoping that within that budget, we're looking at the second phase also. Well, well it all depends yeah. what happens in the first phase. The vaccines will require a non-stop sterile refrigerated environment to stay potent and safe, which has raised concern about sufficient storage facilities on the island. However, Chief Medical Officer Dr. Jacqueline Bisesa McKenzie said the island has facilities for the storage of the COVID-19 vaccines. She adds that the vaccines will be acquired in batches. The storage conditions that are required are conditions that we presently have in country. Mm -hmm. So this is the minus 20 degrees that you would have heard associated with another type of vaccine. And this is the present, present this is like in your, in your freezer. Um, so we are presently, we presently procure vaccines, for example, the polio vaccine, mm -hmm. the, the MMR vaccine that are stored under those conditions. And so we do have the capacity for the storage and transportation of those vaccines. The first batch of the vaccines will be used to vaccinate only 15% of the population, which includes health workers and vulnerable persons. As for rural areas, the CMO said she is not expecting any transportation challenges. This particular vaccine, that's the minus 20. Remember, this is the storage where it is stored for up to six months. It can, can be under those conditions. But then up to 30 days, once it's taken out of that, it can be stored at two degrees to eight degrees, which is your normal conditions in your refrigerator. 
so we would be able to deploy it to, to rural areas, etc., for it to be, um, to be given to the population. The country is expected to receive the first dose of a COVID-19 vaccine between April and June. Jamaica is among six Caribbean Public Health Agency CARFA member states provided with the full down payment required for the COVAX facility. The COVAX facility is designed to accelerate equitable access by countries globally to safe COVID-19 vaccines. Prince Moore, TVJ News. A 90-year-old man from St. James is the latest to die from COVID-19 in Jamaica. This has pushed the country's death toll to 260. The health minister says one more death is being investigated. Meanwhile, 76 new COVID-19 cases were recorded in Jamaica yesterday. This pushes the country's total to 10,000. 987. Their ages range from 1 to 99. St. James recorded most of the new cases. The Ministry of Health says 76 persons are hospitalized with the respiratory illness. 10 are critically ill. The Westmoreland Health Department is reporting that tents erected to provide shelter for individuals to observe health protocols are being stolen. The regional director for the Western Regional Health Authority, Errol Green, told TVJ News that three tents and ten benches have been stolen. The latest theft was carried out on Thursday, where the tents and benches were stolen from the White House Health Center. Mr. Green said some weeks ago, two large tents were stolen from the Negril Health Center, ironically, located beside the Negril Police Station. Mr. Green said the theft of the tents and benches, which are estimated at over $3 million, has created a major dent for the health authority in its effort to provide services to the people of Westmoreland. He is appealing for the return of the tents and benches. More contributions were presented for consideration to Parliament's Joint Select Committee reviewing the Sexual Harassment Bill. Several organizations are making suggestions on how to make the legislation stronger and more meaningful. Herman Green has the details. Thursday's Joint Select Committee of Parliament sitting saw more groups outlining matters in the Sexual Harassment Bill that they believe need to be amended. Among other things, President of the Jamaica Confederation of Trade Unions, Helen Davis White, believes the bill needs broader definitions for terms such as worker to include persons whose employment had been terminated and persons seeking employment. She argues that they too are exposed to sexual harassment. We would also want um, for um, a mechanism that allows for complaints to be made directly to the authority established under the Act for investigations to be carried out. This, she says, is needed as the law suggests reporting to a superior who may be the offender in some cases. The Jamaica Household Workers Union wants the workplace definition broadened as their members experience greater vulnerability. Domestic workers are especially vulnerable to sexual harassment in the homes of their employers. Labor inspectors do not have access to monitor working conditions in this private workspace, which makes it even more difficult. The amendment bill therefore needs to take these factors into account to address the needs of domestic workers. Among Women's Inc. concerns, addressing harassment in public spaces. They suggest a two-phase approach in the legislation. And so in the first phase, we thought that we think that sexual harassment, addressing sexual harassment in controlled environments as covered by the proposed act would be addressed and then after that has gained some, some traction, a second phase could be introduced where legislation to address street harassment is developed. The groups also echoed the call for the statute of limitation on sexual harassment complaints to be extended to at least in line with other civil laws. Another group, Jamaicans for Justice, was also scheduled to present but their representatives were not present. Committee Chairperson and Gender Affairs Minister Olivia Grange tabled the sexual harassment bill in July 2019. Thursday was the final sitting of the committee for 2020. Newly appointed opposition spokesman on finance Julian Robinson says he has enough experience in economics to perform well in the role. Mr. Robinson is also insisting that he will continue to hold the government to account, especially during the COVID-19 pandemic, O'Shane Masters reports. Nineteen new cabinet members announced by opposition leader Mark Golding on Wednesday. 
Among the appointments that stood out were Peter Bunting as opposition spokesman on national security and leader of opposition business in the Senate. So too, the appointment of Julian Robinson as opposition spokesman on finance. Mr. Robinson previously shadowed the science, energy and technology portfolio. He responded to his new appointment in an interview with our new center. I think I have the, the experience, I think I have the knowledge, and where I don't, I will ensure that I build a team around me to supplement me. So, you know, I think I, I know what I know and I know what I don't know, and I'm not um, afraid of acknowledging that. But I, I know enough about economics and how an economy works to, to perform well in this role. Were you expecting this portfolio? Um, the, the leader had a discussion with me um, after the election and offered it, and I accepted. And uh, it's a new challenge for me. It's a new area, but I believe again that I have the knowledge and the experience to do well in it. A few months ago, the Planning Institute of Jamaica (PIOJ) projected that the economy could contract by some 12 percent for both the fiscal and calendar year due to the pandemic. Noting the challenges, Mr. Robinson says he will continue to hold the government to account. Now we are in tough economic times. COVID has brought about new challenges, but from my perspective is ensuring that the decisions taken by the government are in the best interest of the majority of Jamaicans and that we take specific initiatives to provide stimulus for those who are most disadvantaged. And there are a number of critical sectors that have suffered primarily from COVID, um, tourism in particular, and it has a knock-on effect throughout the rest of the economy. So there are specific things that I believe can be done to ensure that the economy gets a restart. Several parliamentary sittings have been halted until next year. He says he is looking forward to chairing the Public Accounts Committee. To ensure that we have an economy that works for all Jamaicans, and on the accountability side, I'll be chairing the Public Accounts Committee. And in short order, early in the new year, we're going to resume our sittings, look at the reports from the Auditor General, and ensure that, again, from the perspective of accountability, we ensure the ministries, agencies, and departments are operating within the government's guidelines. Oshane Masters, TVJ News. And it's now time for a break here on the Midday News. But please stay with us. We'll have more stories when you return. Welcome back and we're continuing the news. Justice Patrick Brooks has been named the new president of the Court of Appeal. He succeeds Justice Dennis Morrison, who will retire today. Mr. Brooks will be sworn in at King's House on Monday. He has had a long career in the judici judiciary and was appointed to the Court of Appeal in January 2012. Justice Morrison has served the Court of Appeal for 12 years. He was appointed president of the court in January 2016. Meanwhile, Justice Dennis Morrison says Justice Patrick Brooks is the most fitting person to take up the post as President of the Court of Appeal. And it gives me no particular pleasure to recognize and to present to you my friend and brother Justice Brooks, who will assume duties as President of the Court of Appeal as of Monday, December 7, 2020. In the view of all members of the court and in my view, Justice Brooks is a most fitting person to be appointed president of the court and to lead it through its next phase. I know that he will have the full support of all members of the court and I wish him all the best as he embarks on this new step in what has already been a remarkable judicial career. And there were glowing tributes for Justice Morrison this morning at the Court of Appeal as he retires. The man who has been at the helm of the Court of Appeal for the past four years was hailed as a consummate professional who served not only locally but regionally as well. Chief Justice Brian Sykes reminisced on the character of Justice Morrison. Justice Morrison's approach particularly to judgments coming from judges at first instance has affirmed and confirmed that there can indeed be a gentler and kinder approach. And so, under his leadership in particular, we have seen where the Court of Appeal here has not shied away from utilizing judgments from first instance judges, provided that they have 
something of value to see to contribute to resolve the particular legal issue and that marks a distinct shift from the stance of the court a few years ago and so it is really what I call an all-embracing approach to the practice of law that all have a space and all can contribute. There were also glowing tributes from the Caribbean Court of Justice on Mr. Morrison's service to the region. Jamaica has every right to be justly proud of and to celebrate this most distinguished son of the soil. Equally, we and the rest of the Caribbean are all entitled to claim him as one of ours. His service to the region has been immeasurable and profound. And Dennis Morrison is embodied greatness. Pedestrians in Negril, Westmoreland will have to wait a bit longer before they can benefit from a walkway being built in the area. This as a result of damage caused to several NWC pipelines during the construction process. Westmoreland Western Member of Parliament Morland Wilson says the pipelines were damaged during preliminary work on the project. Um, these water mains were laid almost 30, 40 years ago. So in discussions with NWC, we discussed whether we could have those pipes re replaced. The parish manager agreed. The project is part of a collaborative effort between the National Works Agency and the Tourism Enhancement So Fund. you will see significant work being undertaken to upgrade the road section in terms of reshaping of the road surface as well as asphalting and local rehabilitation of other sections of this particular roadway. In news overseas, U.S. President-elect Joe Biden says the coronavirus pandemic is dominating his transition into the White House, and his approach to the pandemic will be different from the way the Trump administration has dealt with the deadly disease. He was speaking in an interview with the CNN on Thursday. After President-elect Joe Biden takes office, he will call on Americans to help slow the spread of COVID-19. I'm going to ask the public for 100 days to mask, just 100 days to mask, not forever, 100 days. And I think we'll see a significant reduction. Biden and Vice President-elect Kamala Harris say they'll get a COVID-19 vaccination once one is approved and deemed safe. And they want frontline workers like doctors and nurses to get vaccines as well. The president-elect and I talk about this all the time that the people who need it most um, are, are going to be a priority. On Thursday, more than 100,000 people in the U.S. were listed as hospitalized with the virus, according to the COVID tracking project. California, in the middle of a record surge of cases and hospitalizations, is pulling an emergency break with regional stay-at-home orders. The bottom line is if we don't act now, our hospital system will be overwhelmed. If we don't act now, we'll continue to see a death rate climb. Health officials repeated calls for Americans to curb travel and follow safety guidelines in the coming months. Pandemic fatigue is real and we all cannot wait until this is over. And the end is not that far away. But we have to get through this winter because what lies ahead for the next few months is actually our worst case scenario. News in sports now. Cricket West Indies has won the 2020 Christopher Martin Jenkins Spirit of Cricket Award for, spending, for sending their men's and women's teams to tour England. The men's side arrived in June for a three-test series when coronavirus infection rates in England were high. The women played a T20 series in September at short notice after India and South Africa were unable to tour because of the pandemic. All matches this summer were played in a biosecure environment with players staying in hotels on site and no fans allowed in the grounds. MCC President and former Sri Lanka Captain Kumar Sangakara said West Indies' actions, quote, truly embodied the spirit of cricket. The MCC and BBC who created the award in 2013 in memory of former BBC Test Match Special Commentator and MCC President Martin Jenkins also praised the Pakistan Cricket Board, Cricket Ireland and Cricket Australia for, follow for allowing teams to tour. And that's the Midday News. I'm Giovanni Dennis. Please stand by and join us at 7 for Primetime News. On behalf of the news, sports and production teams, good afternoon.